and the moon is the only light we see. No, I won't be afraid. No, I won't be afraid. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. Jeff Rock. And I'm Kathy Merchant, the Minister of Community Life. Along with Tama Ward, who's our Minister of Children, Family, and Youth. The incredible Jay Esplana as our music director with this awesome band and vocal team. And a special shout out to our tech team under the direction of Andrew McCord. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this time and place and this, uh, this experience of worship together. Before we get started, we just want to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territories of the First Nations peoples. So all of us here in this room are on the land of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. I know many of you are joining online, and you might be on the land of other nations. So if you'd like, please feel free to write those nation names now in the chat. And I just wanted to lift up uh, this past week, the Ahusit Nation has been doing some exploring. Uh, there are two residential schools uh, near where they're located uh, on Flores Island and Mears Island. Uh, the residential schools were open between 1900 uh, up through 1983 is when the last one was closed. So it was actually one of the very last ones to close. Uh, and they know for certain now that there are unmarked graves of children at both of those residential schools. They're still figuring out how many, so they're not ready to make an announcement yet, uh, but that will be coming soon. So if we just hold them in our hearts right now. And as we hold in our hearts those uh, children in unmarked graves, we also hold in our hearts our children and youth. And there's a young people's program where the young people will be invited forward. There'll be a lighting of our Christ candle. And then young people are welcome to go to the Center for Peace, which is our other building across the back alley there for our children's programming. Or they're welcome to stay here in our worship with us throughout the duration of the service. As always, you're welcome to participate as much or as little as you want in today's service. You can. Get up and dance. I already saw some people were enjoying a little bit of dancing during that uh, opening number. You can join in the singing or you can just let the music and the, the words wash over you as well. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge, have you, have you been hearing the organ around here a little bit more recently? 
I also want to do a special thank you to Bruce, who's been playing our organ for a lot of introits and, and uh, recessionals at the end of the worship service. And isn't it great to have that refurbished organ? <laughs> Amen. Cool. I think that's all that I've got. So now let's stand as we're able and let's share a sign of peace with one another. Alrighty, folks, take a nice deep breath. And take another one. Savor that spring air. I want to take a moment and acknowledge that one of our beloved Alan McLean died yesterday. Um, many of you will know Alan. He usually sat about halfway back over here, right around Hugh, and was driven to church by Bob and Lloyd every Sunday, and was a real active and engaged member and much beloved person. And so we hold him in our thoughts today. We hold him in our prayers and his family. Uh, Alan, as uh, he was always telling us and reminding people, was a very human man. A very, very human man. And I was thinking about him when I wrote this morning's opening prayer. And so... Let us pray in memory of Alan. Creator God, maker of mountains and monarch butterflies, maker of muskrats and magpies, of 
marigolds and manta rays of maples and magnolia, maker of you and of me. We give thanks for the gift of life that is evident all around us in this spring season. And we acknowledge the very real existence of death in our world. And we hold on to the hope of hopes of the great mystery of life after death that you hold for us yet to uncover. This day, as we gather as a family of faith, we join our prayers together and mourn the loss of one of our members and give thanks for his life, for his existence in our midst, and for our collective love, for together we are greater than the sum of our parts. In your many names we pray, amen. Well, such are the cycles of life. We grieve the passing of one dear friend, even as we celebrate a really beautiful youth retreat that happened here in the sanctuary this past weekend. And uh, we had seven teenagers between grade eight and grade 10 who gathered mostly up on the stage here with their seven mentors. I won't say the ages there, but... <laughs> We called them the youngers and the olders. And it was this amazing 24 hours of sharing life together and hearing especially from, from these young people. So uh, you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. And of course, that will culminate in our, um, in our confirmation liturgy on May 5th, so not to be missed. Um, I'm going to invite all the children who are with us this morning to come forward and gather up here at the front. And while they're coming forward to explain to all of you um, that you have an opportunity to actually be involved in the blessing of these teenagers of whom I just spoke. And um, in a very practical way, following the service this Sunday, today, and the following two Sundays, there's going to be seven stoles, seven long strips of cloth, and you're going to be invited to trace your hand on one of these stoles, at least one, maybe two, depending on how, many, how much uptake we get, and then to write your name inside the palm print, and then maybe decorate your hand. There's a sample there. It, it will be a way of symbolically uh, letting the, the teenagers know that this congregation just supports them and surrounds them with our presence and our love. So everyone, whether you know the teenagers or not, it doesn't matter. Everyone who's part of this community is welcome to come over, encouraged to come over uh, and, add your, and add your handprint to... Um, to those symbolic stoles. All right, we are um, turning the corner on a season and I have a special guest who's gonna come up and be with you this morning. This is someone you're gonna see quite a bit of over the next few months because uh, Wilda is the, um, I guess she leads, I'm gonna say, the, the gardening connection circle. So all our beautiful grounds here at Canadian Memorial, she has um, an eye and a hand on those and she's going to talk to you a little bit this morning. Okay, Oops, there, better, I better use that. Yes, um, Tama didn't do her kneel thing today, but every Sunday I watch and I go, oh man, I couldn't do that. And so I brought this stool. Uh, <laughs> Just, just so that people won't be holding their breath so much <laughs> and, <laughs> and that I'll feel safe. <clears throat> so here we go. Okay, settled. So now, um, part of the reason that I can't get down on my knee quite the way Tama can is that I'm quite a bit older than she is. And uh, I am way older than you folks are. Um, I was born back in the 1900s. 
And <laughs> so, so I thought, you know, what are we going to have in common? Tama has asked me to help out once in a while with the, the uh, program over the summer, and I thought, what are we going to have in common? And uh, well, one thing is humor. I love to laugh. And I love the jokes that some of you folks told last Sunday, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, I like to learn. How many of you are still learning? OK, all but two hands went up. I guess they know it all already. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know it all. I definitely don't know it all, but I do enjoy to learn. And a few um, years ago, I took a gardening course that really opened my eyes about ways to garden that are good for the earth and good for the soil. And so I wanted to use that knowledge and share it. And so by volunteering to garden around the church, it, it, it solves that. And so uh, it's a win all around. So Tama asked me if I would help out, as I said, and um, next week is going to be Earth Day. And she said, could we open up the garden? And I thought about it, and I realized maybe we need to wait a few weeks for that. So I've asked for a picture. There's a picture of what the garden looks like right now. <clears throat> and you'll see that it's still pretty much put to bed for the winter. There's leaves and grass there. And part of the reason I don't want to disturb it is that uh, there might be some birds wanting <clears throat> something to build their nests with. And also, there could be ladybugs and bees and things sleeping under there that uh, aren't ready to hatch yet. They say, we, we need to wait till it's 10 degrees both in the daytime and at night to give everything a chance to hatch before we should be disturbing that soil. And besides that, most seeds, even if we put them in the ground, they would just kind of sit there and rot because it's not warm enough yet. But an, ex an exception is peas. They like it when it's cool. So after Tama took that picture, <clears throat> I carefully moved some of the mulch along just one side, tried not to disturb things too much. And after church, I will have a, um, I, I will go out there with these pea seeds, and anybody who's interested can come and help plant a row of peas. Now, I was picturing some much littler children <laughs> who kind of get, get excited about planting peas. I'm not sure. This group, you, oh. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay, excellent. You like planting peas? Sure, okay. Well, I just didn't want to do something that was old hat for, for some of you. Anyhow, that's, uh, that's the plan. So I'll be there after church briefly. And then as, the, as it gets warmer and more suitable, then we'll, we'll be out in the garden more often. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, one thing at a time. No, I, I got it. Got it. Okay. Amar, do you wanna, do you wanna light our candle? for us here. Thanks, Wilda. And as Amar lights our candle, we'll give thanks for the gazillion little seeds and buds in our world and in our lives just waiting to burst into bloom. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am poor. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. My hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows dream, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, 
Let us pray. Holy One, loving God, free our minds from judgment. Teach us to open our hearts the way Jesus opened the hearts of the people around him. And help us to care for one another as unfailingly as you care for us. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is Matthew 7 verses 1 to 5 from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Do not judge so that you may not be judged, for the judgment you give will be the judgment you get, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, 
but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. How did you come to write this book? What really struck me was that too few books were about my people. Where are our stories? Where's our representation? Would you give us the pleasure of reading an excerpt? Yo, Sharonda, girl, you be pregnant again? If I is, Ray Ray is gonna be a real father this time around. Thank you. Monk, your books are good, but they're not popular. Editors, they want a black book. They have a black book. I'm black, and it's my book. You know what I mean. Look at what they published. Look at what they expect us to write. I just want to rub their noses in it. <laughs> I'd be standing outside in the night. Deadbeat dads, rappers, crack. You said you wanted black stuff. That's black, right? I see what you're doing. We sold a book. No. We believe Mr. Lee has written a bestseller. It's a joke. The most lucrative joke you've ever told. Now, is Stag a pseudonym? Yeah. Mr. Lee can't use his real name. Is this based on your actual life? Yeah, you think some bitch-ass college boy can come up with that shit? No, no. No, I don't. Can I ask what you were in for? Was it murder? Yeah, you said that, not me. They ran 300,000 copies. Your books changed people's lives. They're offering $4 million for the movie rights. Yes! The dumber I behave, the richer I get. Tell it like it is. This has gone too far. Stag Arley is still on the run from authorities. You haven't done anything. It's not like they can arrest you. Tell it like it is. Wish I could go back to not selling books. Is it bad to cater to people's tastes? People want to love you, Monk. You should let them love all of you. There's already so much buzz because of the movie deal. Michael B. Jordan is circling. We want to put him on the cover in one of those um, uh, scarves, I guess you would call them, tied around his head. A do-rag? Do-rag, that's it. Do-rag and a tank top with the muscles showing. Ooh, something called a fire department. <laughs> We're thinking we can get it out in Hunter Juneteenth. I didn't even really want to preach on this sermon. I just wanted to show the movie. <laughs> I was like, how much time do we have? Can we reserve the sanctuary for two extra hours today? Uh, how many folks here actually saw the movie American Fiction? Some folks, good. I guess not everybody loved it. Hopefully enough of you loved it. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly, highly recommend it. It's amazing. Uh, it won an Oscar for, I think it was best screenplay, adapted screenplay. And uh, it was possibly the best thing that uh, Jeffrey Wright has done yet, which is really saying something. Uh, he's the main character. Uh, so if you can't tell yet from the trailer, so Jeffrey Wright uh, plays um, a highly educated black author and college professor who has carefully crafted novels don't hardly sell anything. No one wants to read that. What they want to read is these kind of quick reads with really uncomplicated, stereotypical kind of characters. And at a book convention, he meets Sinatra Golden, who's played by the always hilarious Issa Rae, and uh, sees that she's become very loved and is selling out all these uh, auditoriums, giving all these talks. And uh, she's writing a lot of novels about this idea of ghetto life and kind of black poverty. So he gets drunk one night and decides he's going to write something like that too as a kind of satire. And then it becomes number one on the bestseller list. And so suddenly he, based on the advice from his publisher, has to pretend that this is his actual story and assume a totally different life than the one he actually has. And uh, hilarity and brilliant social satire ensue. But one of the most remarkable things about the movie is what I just described to you and what you saw in the trailer is actually only half the movie. 
Uh, the other half of the movie is about what he's actually facing in his personal life, the kind of troubles he has in his real life. Uh, and these are things that people from all races and all socioeconomic classes, these are the kind of troubles we all have. Things like loss in your life, grief, the difficulties of caring for an aging parent, supporting a loved one as they come to terms with their sexuality, and learning to love yourself fully. And these themes actually make up about half the movie. Uh, but I think this was actually really kind of brilliant or really, I don't know, it was a very interesting move. None of that was in the marketing for the movie, which makes it kind of like what the story is telling you, that we have these ideas about people. So we see like, oh, okay, this story, this is totally about racism and racial stereotypes, that's all it is. But once you're watching it, it actually has all this depth and all these other things that have nothing to do with racism that any of us can experience but that's kind of left out of it because that's not what we see and maybe that's not what we're looking for because we have this preconceived idea of other people being different than us. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew tells us, do not judge so you may not be judged for the judgment you give will be the judgment you get and the measure you give will be the measure you get. And then it talks about this idea that we have a log in our own eye, something that's keeping us from seeing others. So I love that image of it being in our eye, because it's blocking us from seeing this huge thing. I mean, I, I wear contact lenses, even having an eyelash in my eye is excruciating. But it's like we have a log in our eye that blocks us from seeing. But then we see that other people, they might have something small, and then we hyper-focus on them and wanting to change them and wanting to fix them, and we ignore what we have and all the judgments and all the things we're bringing to the table. So the movie and this idea reminds me of this brilliant TED Talk from 2009 by the Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She read, she's written many books. She's really amazing. Uh, she wrote Americana, Half of a Yellow Sun, We Should All Be Feminists, and several other books. And the whole purpose of her TED Talk, it's called The Danger of a Single Story, is the same idea. And in it, she talks about growing up in Nigeria uh, to sort of upper middle class in Nigeria. English is her first language. And then coming to school in America and how her white roommate in college, when she first met her, she said, oh, teach me your tribal music. So she plays Mariah Carey. Because <laughs> that's what she listens to. And she says, well, what was it like? To, how did you learn English? Did you live in a hut? Like what, you know, her roommate has these kind of ideas of what it means for her to be from Nigeria. And then she starts writing, she's studying English, and she has a literature professor, and he's a white upper-class man, and he complains that her stuff is not authentically African, as he puts it. And she says, well, what does that mean? I don't know, I'm African and I'm writing it, doesn't that mean it's African? Kind of like this, it's I'm black and it's my book, therefore it's a black book, what do you mean, what's your idea of this? Uh, and the professor says, well, no, the problem, what is it, is um, your characters are too much like me an educated upper middle class man. They drive cars, they're not starving. Therefore, they're not authentically African. This is from a college professor of, I assume, a good school. She's very, very smart, so I assume this is a good school. And she says, but the problem is, this is how we create a single story. We show a people as one thing, and only one thing, over and over and over again. And then that's what they become. So we have one idea. So for her, the people around her, the white people around her in the States, were so used to the idea of Africans as fitting kind of one stereotype. So anyone who didn't, they'd say, oh, well, it's because you're not African. And it's the same in this movie. It's, so he comes from an upper middle class background. He's very, very educated. His family, they, they have help that they pay. And, but that's not black enough because that's not what the rest of us have as an idea of what blackness means. And she says, the problem with a single story is it creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but they're incomplete. They make one story the only story. So it makes me wonder, what are the one stories we have about other people? So when I would work in the Middle East, you know, as I've mentioned many, many times, I'd meet with lots of different Israelis and lots of different Palestinians from all different backgrounds. And some of the people we'd meet with are peacemakers who've devoted their life to working with people from the other side, who are these really heroic, astounding people, honestly the best people I've ever met in my life. And they're both Israeli and Palestinian who are doing this. And then we'd meet other people who were in the military or who were in prison for committing violent crimes or who were just kids or all these different backgrounds. And then I'd come home 
and I'd give talks about it, and people would say, well, what are the Israelis like? I've heard the Israelis are like this. Or what are the Palestinians like? I think they're like this, right? And I'm like, gosh, what does that even mean? What does that mean? What are they like? What are all of us like here? So all of us, okay, so we all go to this church. We may not all be Christian, although most of us are Christian here. And we go to this church. We live in Vancouver. It's like, uh, and I, I know this to be true because I'm also from the States. It's like when Americans come and they're like, oh, but you're being rude right now, but I thought all Canadians were nice. <laughs> I'm like, really? I don't know. Well, we have these ideas, right? And it, there's, a, um, there's a social psychology idea. It sounds very complicated, but I'll quickly, it makes a lot of sense. It's called in-group heterogeneity versus out-group homogeneity bias. And it means, so that sounds really complicated, but I can quickly break it down. So it's the idea that the people in your in-group, you know that we're different. So those of us here in this room, we know our differences. We've gotten to know each other a bit over time. Maybe this is our first time and we have no idea. Maybe you think we're all nice. I don't know, I hate to break it to you. Maybe we're not always nice all the time. But we, the people we're around, we're with them all the time. So we know that we're not exactly the same. So even if we all go to this church, even if we're all from Vancouver, even if we all come from one particular background, we know that there's a wide diversity, wide range of experiences and personalities and backgrounds and trauma and occupations and sexualities and identities in that group. But then we don't know people from other groups. And our brain likes to simplify things and likes to make patterns. So we make a lot of assumptions about other groups. So we say, oh, okay. Oh, so you're from Halifax, so you're going to be like this. Or you're from Nigeria, so you're going to be like this. Or you're a Republican, or you're a Palestinian, so you're going to be like this. And we assume we know everything about the person. And then we do this really insidious thing, where then if they start acting in a way that doesn't fit with what we assume, we try to explain it to ourselves. We have this kind of cognitive dissonance. So we're like, oh, well, okay, I guess that's not true for you, but maybe you're one of the good ones. <laughs> or maybe, you know, well, is your background? Like, where are you really from? Like, hold on, let me try to make sense of this. Because we want things to fit our patterns, because that's how our brain works. If, we're, if our brain is always taking in endlessly complex things, that's exhausting. I, I find life exhausting anyway. I can't imagine if I weren't trying to make patterns in some way. So making a pattern isn't a bad thing. You know, um, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi, she, does, she says, you know, stereotypes, there is a way that they make sense. It's not that they're based on nothing at all. But then when we reduce people to that, when it's just like, okay, that's what I know about you, so I'm going to make those assumptions. My husband is from India and is Muslim. And I remember when I called to tell my aunt, who'd never met him, that I was marrying a Muslim man. Uh, she said, but if you marry a Muslim man, you're not going to be allowed to drive. Lots of assumptions. I actually do most of the driving. Samir hates driving. It's for jokes on her. And then even a few years into the relationship, I was complaining to a white friend who had a white partner uh, about chores in the house. And I know none of you in this, in this room have ever complained about your partner and chores. I know that's never come up at all. But I was kind of complaining about it. And she's like, oh, I bet he's not doing those chores because he's Muslim. He's a Muslim man. That's interesting. So I ask her, so does your, does your white Christian man partner help you with these things? No, he doesn't. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's very interesting. So if Samir isn't cooking, it's because he's a Muslim man. But if your white Christian husband isn't helping, it's for some other reason. Because there is complexity in your own tradition, but not in other people's traditions. So everyone else is just the same. Right? So that's how we see each other. And of course, it's easy to kind of point out the hypocrisy in other people. You know, part of what's so hilarious in the movie is you see the white people who are saying and acting in these ridiculous ways. And it, it's so easy to kind of laugh at them, be like, oh, I would never be like that. I'm so much more advanced than that. But we're not, right? We all do these things. I remember when Samir and I went to Ecuador, and I was so impressed. The bus system was way more like streamlined and so nice and made way more sense than the bus system in Seattle. At the time, the roads were, there weren't any potholes in them, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder what I was thinking when I was coming to Ecuador. I had all these preconceived notions of, okay, I'm going to a country in South America, it's going to be like this, and then it's way nicer than what I'm used to. So what are the ideas that I kind of have? And that's part of what's so beautiful as we travel, right, as we meet other people. I feel like nowadays we actually have less excuse than ever 
to kind of make these single story judgments about each other. Because it's in many ways easier to travel now than it has been, even if you can't leave your house. You can go online, you can watch any kind of movies now, movies from all sorts of backgrounds. You can read books but written by people from all sorts of backgrounds. We can actually take in lots and lots of different experiences. I remember a few years ago when a lot of white people started talking about anti-racism after the murder of George Floyd. One of the best pieces of advice I read in the root uh, um, from someone who's black said that, you know what, white people, you want to know what we think rather than interrogating all of us. Why don't you just start following social media accounts written by BIPOC people, people from other races, and don't say anything. Don't start following them and start arguing with them or start writing and explaining how you're not like these other white people that they might be talking about. But just follow them and start taking it in. Start taking in more stories. And the more we can do that and just show up for each other and listen. And then I, I really, I think a lot of it is just this emotional regulation. When we find out like, oh wait, that person is giving a story that's different than what I expected. Rather than getting defensive about it, rather than, than trying to re-explain why our original idea is correct, or why we ourselves could never be racist, or going the opposite direction where then we're over-apologizing, and in so doing, we're centering ourselves again and making it all about us and our perceptions. How about we listen? How about we stop expecting ourselves to know everything and just listen to other people and drop some of our egos and take it in? And I think that's really our hope. That's hopefully what we can work on in this. I saw this really great analogy a couple years ago. They said racism is a lot like being in a leaky boat. It's just filling up with water. And it doesn't fill up with water because we actively put the water in the boat, but it's leaky. So around us, we just have all the stereotypes that are already around us, all the ideas that kind of permeate things. So what we have to do is slowly bail out the boat. And I think we can best do that by making time for each other, listening to each other, purposely trying to befriend people who are different than us, and then listening to them and not talking over them. And I think if we do this, slowly, slowly, we can work on this. So that hopefully in another generation or two, you try to show that trailer to your grandchildren, and they won't have any idea what it's about. It won't make any sense. But unfortunately, what we see now, that really rings true. It's the same as the TED Talk from like 15 years ago. Uh, that's still such a problem. So I think if we just try to be with each other, we can get past this and stop holding each other in such a negative light and maintaining such stereotypes. And finally, uh, it's always a good idea to end a sermon with James Baldwin. Just if you're ever giving a sermon, that's just, that's a good tip. You'll never go wrong, <laughs> truly. And uh, James Baldwin reminds us that each of us, helplessly and forever, contains the other male and female, female and male, white and black, and black and white. We're a part of each other. Many of my countrymen appear to find this fact exceedingly inconvenient and even unfair, and so very often do I, but we can't do anything about it. So instead, why don't we understand that we really do have more in common with each other than not, and do what we can to start listening to one another. Amen.
Crystal Dos Santos. Let's assume a posture of prayer, whatever that looks like for you. Let us pray. Spirit of life and love, God of all nations, from whom all things come and to whom they return. We gather today to support one another and to learn from your teachings, sharing a commitment to truth, peace, and justice. There's so much work to do. We've only begun to imagine your hopes for us. But despite the ongoing violence and distrust in our society, in this quiet moment, let us give thanks for the blessings in our lives for home and family, for friendship and meaningful work, for the blessing of all creation, we offer you our gratitude. We lift up those places in our lives and in our own hearts where we carry so many judgments and so many burdens. But with your presence and care, may we find peace, support, and a healthy path forward. We lift up all those who are suffering both within this community and in the wider world. Today especially, we lift up Alan McLean and his loved ones. All those who are facing bombings, drones, or mass starvation. Those experiencing racial discrimination or police brutality. Those struggling with financial debt or tremendous loss. Those who feel completely alone, spirit of life, and healer of all wounds, hear our prayer. Help us become your loving hands here in the world. Help us to let go of our judgments and blindness towards one another. Help us learn how to see others through your eyes. And let us join with those who promote compassion and wisdom in all they do and devote our lives to you. May we become emissaries of justice, ambassadors of love, and agents of you, divine presence. In your holy name we pray, amen. Now if you'll join me in the Casa de Sol prayer by John Philip Newell. Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe, your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the whole human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings. For the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen. dream that reaches out, reaches out to find where love begins. Every word of every story, every star in every sky, every corner of creation lives to testify. Oh, 
Beautiful. Please be seated. I have a few announcements for us. As I'm giving the announcements, our greeters will pass around the offering plates. Thanks for doing that. Uh, first announcement <clears throat> is the Metro Vancouver Alliance Housing Group will have a meeting today at noon in the Fireside Room. That's over in the Center for Peace on the second floor. They'll be sharing some information about the surveys uh, that they were receiving about housing and co-ops and, uh, and next steps to take with the group. So please join them there if you're at all interested in the housing crisis or anything around housing. They're meeting at noon. Uh, also, Karen Vander Hayden will be in the Great Hall. She has amazingly organized with Guru Nanak's Free Kitchen to allow eight of us uh, from this church uh, on the last, let's see, the fourth Sunday of every month to volunteer at their food truck on the downtown east side, handing out food on the downtown east side. Uh, so she will be there in the Great Hall today um, and taking volunteer names for this, uh, let's see, for two weeks from now, two Sundays from now. So talk to her if you want some more information. Uh, again, Michelle Cobbin on Mondays runs the TOTS and Caregivers drop-in group. Uh, it's open to anyone who's interested, anyone who has kids between newborn up through preschoolers. There's puppets, story time, songs, books. It's very, very fun and uh, by donation only. So please join that. Bring your kids or your grandkids or kids in the neighborhood if you're interested. Uh, on Tuesdays, our weekly prayers for Palestine and Israel continue. Uh, we meet online on Zoom every Tuesday from noon till uh, 12.30. Feel free to join us uh, just to pray, hold some space, can bring any prayers or any hopes you have for the region. Uh, we'll be meeting again, and if you need the Zoom link, uh, just ask me, I can send it to you. I believe I have a clip for Soda Crackers, uh, the band that's going to be performing next Sunday. Let's see if we can play that clip. So bad, I got a I'm so lonesome all of the time. Great, thank you. Many thanks to the group that's organized that. So they're gonna be here next Sunday. Uh, so after the service, there will be a $5 soup luncheon over in the Great Hall at noon, followed by the doors will open here at one o'clock and the concert's at 1.30. 
um, and it's pay what you can. Please bring a friend. Uh, we'd like uh, new folks to experience our amazing concert space and enjoy our hospitality. So please join us next week if you can. Um, back by popular demand, we had a few folks ask if we could do another uh, truth mandala around the situation in Palestine and Israel. We had one about two months ago, and uh, it's a community grief ritual and a healing ritual uh, to all those who are reading the news, hearing the news, or have loved ones in the Middle East um, that we just have a lot of sorrow for. So we will be having another one of these, this Truth Mandala, um, at the end of the month on Friday, April 26th at 10 a.m. It'll be here in the sanctuary. The first one we did was just for our members, but this next one is open to all. So please feel free to invite anyone you know, uh, any of your loved ones who just have, need some time to heal and to share around the conflict. And uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. Uh, Street Meals and Kids Care's annual plant sale uh, is now on. So Mary Lou and some others have the order forms over in the uh, Center for Peace. So the deadline for ordering plants is Friday, April 26th. So it's about two weeks from now. And uh, the pickup will be just before Mother's Day, uh, which it'll be on Saturday, May 11th um, in the parking lot. So please order plants, any um, annuals that you'd like. There are herbs. There are these beautiful arrangements. Uh, please order those. And uh, the proceeds are going to go to Street Meals and Kids Cares. And you can order online with your credit card or uh, pay cash at delivery or give a check to Joanne Hausch. And I can give you that information if you'd like. And then two Sundays from now on, let's see, April 28th, the Burrard Street Story Guild will be performing here uh, instead of the sermon. They're going to explore the story of Job with spoken word, music, and dance, and will invite the audience to reflect on our own experiences of suffering. So they're going to have two performances that day, one at 1030, and again, it'll be during the service, and then the second one will be at 2 o'clock, and this is open to all. Please feel free to invite any other families you know who might be interested in seeing the performance. And let's see, the 10th Avenue Community Market, uh, so part of Kids Cares, they're still looking for a uh, delivery driver, so reach out to Joyce Ferguson if you're interested in helping them with that. Uh, we are looking for another facility host to start in May, so if you're at all interested, please talk to Randy. Uh, his email is randy at uh, canadianmemorial.org. And I wanted to let you know that uh, Jeff and I are having this birthday fundraiser, and as of this morning, we're up to 32 donors. So many thanks. Thank you all so much for donating to that. We're trying to get 40 donors to donate $100 each uh, in time for our 40th birthdays. So Jeff just had his 40th birthday. I have mine in a few months. And so we're doing this fundraiser. So thank you to all you who have contributed. That was a lot of announcements. I apologize. Bob has one more. Thank you, Kathy. This on? If I start talking, let's do that. <clears throat> Tony Peroni and I will be offering a connection circle meeting on Monday evenings on Zoom beginning May 6th. And uh, we'll be around after to ask question, answer questions if you have any. As a lot of you know, we've been doing a lot of series, a series of circles aimed at facilitating people developing and maintaining a contemplative practice. Our last circle was on engaged contemplation where we used a book by Adam Bucko, an interesting Episcopal priest who works in the street in New York City with the youth. While participants are uniformly positive, they found the biggest challenge being continually triggered, often due to just the sheer size of the problems, as anyone who does social work knows, of course. So the next, next circle is entitled Contemplative Practice for Challenging Times. It introduces tools to specifically help us to maintain our emotional and spiritual stability, not to be so triggered. We use a book of a fascinating woman, Kyra Lingo, a longtime student of the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. She's also Bucko's partner, who with him formed a group to use Christian and Buddhist practices for contemplation and action. It's very accessible for beginners as well as experienced practitioners. It has an intriguing title, We Were Made for These Times. Now, this quote comes from a Jungian psychoanalyst, uh, Clarissa Estes, who implores us to not lose hope, that in fact, we're made for these times that for years we've been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. It's reminiscent of the Hopi prophecy that came out in the millennium that ends by noting we are the ones we have been waiting for. I love the way the young people are coming out and turning things on their head, that argument that today's problems are so overwhelming we should just sink into hopelessness. 
So as much as I'd like to end with my standard jokes, I'll defer to Kathy's wish to keep this short as possible and simply leave you with a drum roll from John. These are gonna... <laughs> Great, thank you, Bob and John. And now as we go forth in the week ahead, let's pay attention to our judgments. Let's notice when we're not being fully present for other people, not really taking them in, not realizing their full humanity. Let's do what we can to love those around us and to really see them for who they are. Amen. Ain't no valley low enough Ain't no river wide enough